Hey, my friends, it's Tom with Watchman River. Thanks for joining me today. We have another good day that the Lord has made for us to serve him, to rejoice and to be glad. And earth is getting very, very dark, very dark. We're going to talk about that. You know, I never thought in all the years I thought about one day we're going to be living in the last days. I'm old and I've been looking at this for over 40 years, but I thought, what is it going to be like in those last days? I never imagined we would see darkness like we see today. I really didn't think we would see it get this bad. But I always tell you guys, the darker the world gets, that gospel message gets brighter and brighter because people realize, whoa, there's only one thing to cling to, the finished work of Jesus and his atoning blood. He paid for our sins with his blood. That message is brighter. But I have so much stuff to cover today. If I don't start, we're never going to ever. I, I have way too much stuff. But a lot of stuff is happening right now. I'm going to start in Haiti. Okay. This is from Mail Online. U.S. sends in Marines to evacuate embassy personnel from Haiti amid bloody uprising as stench of decaying corpses drive people from their homes and violence threatens to engulf the Dominican Republic. I saw a video that was so dark and graphic of cannibalism going on in the streets of Haiti, of the guys who were overthrowing the government, eating human flesh. And I kind of wish I never clicked on that video, but I did. The darkness in this world is getting crazy. I've always told you guys, I really believe in 2020, a demonic spirit fell upon this world. And we have seen darkness increase month by month since then as we await this rapture. But the stuff going on in Haiti is crazy. It says more than 80% of the territory of the capital of Haiti, Port-au-Prince, is under the control of armed bandit groups. Germany and European countries are following the U.S. and they're evacuating the embassy in Haiti and it's just it's a total nightmare over there and yeah it's, I got another headline Haiti cannibal gang are eating people they've killed on the streets as violence erupts talk about that the demonic activity just picking up in this world the veil is thinning between where we exist and the demonic realm and we're just seeing incredible things. But I want to I want to I want to speak about Haiti for a minute because some people will have the frame of mind, well, who cares what goes on over there? Who cares? And I want to share a story that I shared a while ago on this channel about a couple that I was very close to at one point in my life who adopted two children from Haiti. And during the adoption process, which anyone who's done it knows it's a long process. It's an expensive process. Well, they visited these girls they were going to adopt from Haiti a couple of times during that process. It was about a two-year process for them, maybe three-year. And the first time they went there, they brought a duffel bag for these girls they were adopting. They brought a, a duffel bag full of stuff, full of stuff, toys, clothes, stuff that just you can't get over there. And they wanted to bless these girls they were adopting. So they brought this duffel bag. And when they showed up to this orphanage that these two girls were living in, which was a Bible-believing Christian orphanage, the girls were like, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, when they saw this duffel bag. And what did they do? They ran. And as they ran with the duffel bag in their hands, my friends followed them. And they ran through the streets of this orphanage to the edge of the orphanage where the rest of the people were. And these little girls gave away everything that was in that duffel bag. Every single thing that was in there, they gave it away. Because in their orphanage, they had enough. And they recognized that kids didn't have anything outside of the confines of that orphanage. And they gave it all away. Another story about the same trip that I'll never forget when they told me this. So they were sleeping in the orphanage 
my friends were who were adopting these two kids. And all of a sudden, the first night they were there, 2 a.m., kids shaking them, wake up, come on, wake up. My friends were like, what's going on? And they heard just a lot of noises going on. And they said, follow, you know. So they got up and they followed these kids and they're running through the orphanage streets. And they end up at a church, 2 a.m. They end up at a church with music blaring and people praising God. And my friend said, I have never, ever seen people praise God like those people did at that service. I've never seen it. Hands over their head, crying, praising Lord. And these people have nothing. They have nothing. And my friends leaned over to one of the leaders and said, so you do this on Thursday night or whatever day it was there that you do this on Thursday night at 2 a.m. They said, oh, no, we do this every night. Every night. And I, 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 I hear that story and I just say, <laughs> whoa, to America, you know. I had a hard time going to church yesterday because of the hour we lost with the time change. These people are going at 2 a.m. waking up to go praise the Lord. People who have nothing every night of the week. So my bottom line of this is pray for the people of Haiti. There are a lot of Bible-believing Christians and there are orphanages there and they need your prayers. Okay. What next? Here we go. Um, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says he intends to press ahead with an invasion of the city of Rafah on the southern border of the Gaza Strip in defiance of U.S. President Joe Biden, who has warned such an offensive would be a red line. That's what Biden said over the weekend. When asked on Sunday whether Israeli forces would move into Rafah, Netanyahu replied, we'll go there. We're not going to leave. You know, I have a red line. You know what the red line is? That October 7th never happens again. Never happens again. The PM was referring to the murderous Hamas raid that killed more than 1,160 people in Israel and triggered this war. So Bibi spent part of the weekend barking back at President Biden, saying, you're not the leader of this country. And the current administration is trying to paint this thing that everyone's against Netanyahu and he's just this crazy leader who's doing all that. They don't really, the majority of the people are for Netanyahu. The majority of the people. This is from the Times of Israel. Biden says he's prepared to return to Israel, give Knesset speech regarding the war in Gaza. U.S. President Joe Biden indicates that he is prepared to return to Israel and he will even speak before the Knesset. Some left-leaning pundits have been urging Biden to take this step in order to bypass Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's hardline government and speak directly to the Israeli public about the U.S. vision for ending the war in Gaza. As they say, peace and safety, sudden destruction comes. We're getting very close to that. We're getting very close to the rapture of the church. Very close. This is from Israel Today. Biden says that he would love to come to the Knesset in Jerusalem and explain his position on Gaza and the Palestinians directly to the Israelis. I'm sure that Israeli lawmakers would love the chance to explain directly to Biden why the rules of the games, the game has changed and why the people of Israel will no longer accept the old concepts and formulas that made October 7th possible. This is from Baba News on Telegram. Really good thoughts here. He said, more and more countries are turning on Israel, including the Israeli-hating United Nations, just as the Bible says would happen as we get closer to the end. Turning on Israel. This is more than just the Jewish state trying to survive. This is Bible prophecy coming alive right before our eyes. I totally agree. Amen. I totally agree. Another one from Baba News. He shared a, Jer a Jerusalem Post headline that says the Palestinian initiative to suspend Israel from the United Nations. And he said the Palestinians will attempt an initiative that will freeze or suspend Israel's participation in the UN General Assembly discussions, as well as its ability to vote in any of the UN debates. In other words, Israel will not have a voice in the UN to even try to defend themselves 
to the world. A suspension of membership from the General Assembly is a complicated move that requires a vote by all 15 members of the UN Security Council, along with a two-thirds majority vote of the 193-member Assembly. Political officials of the Arab League have recently leaked this out, which follows remarks made by Palestinian ambassador to the UN last week when he stated that Israel could not continue to sit among us. Whether this move succeeds or not, this is very damaging to Israel's image. This has happened one time since the UN was first established. They're all turning in Israel. I'm shocked. I, I'm shocked, honestly, when I see how many comments that I've seen on my videos of people who say, you're being deceived by supporting Israel in these last days. It's like, am I? Hmm. Start over again. That's what I usually reply with. Go back to Genesis. This time, ask the Holy Spirit for guidance and go back through the entire word of God. And I hope this time when you seek the Holy Spirit's guidance, you will see God's hand is on that nation and on that people. Zechariah 12, 3 tells us that all the nations will be gathered against Israel. They are beginning to gather at the UN. This is from the Jerusalem Post. Ramadan clashes ensue as forces be, uh, find Hamas-linked terror group in the north. Crowds of worshipers headed to Jerusalem and Al-Aqsa Mosque on Sunday evening, yesterday, last night, to mark the first night of Ramadan with Palestinian and Israeli media reporting heavy crowding throughout the old city and isolated incidents of clashes with police. Footage published from one location in the old city showed police using batons to push back a crowd. The background of the incident was unclear. Footage from other locations showed crowds backed up at checkpoints where people were let onto the Temple Mount in a trickle. First day of Ramadan, to me, went as smooth as they can go. Yesterday, I didn't see. Some people were trying to say, oh, it's worse than ever. No, I don't, I don't think so. From what I saw, it was just a normal opening night of Ramadan. We'll see. It could change tonight, tomorrow. You know, you got a month of this. But the first day was a normal Ramadan day from what I saw. And I saw these videos they're referring to. This is from the Times of Israel. Jordan says the Temple Mount access restrictions push the situation toward an explosion. Jordan's, uh, Jordan's foreign minister, Savadi, says restrictions imposed by Israel on Muslim worshippers' access to Jerusalem's Al-Aqsa Mosque compound during Ramadan were pushing the situation toward an explosion. In remarks to state media, uh, Safadi says his country rejects Israel's announced move to impose some limitations on access to the holy site during Ramadan. Israel said last week it will not reduce the number of worshippers allowed to pray on the Temple Mount in the first week of Ramadan from the levels in previous years amid serious concerns over efforts by Hamas and its backer Iran to stir up violence at the Flashpoint site and in Jerusalem in general during the Holy Muslim uh, Month. However, police were accused of denying some Arab Israelis entry to the site last night in apparent violation of a statement by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's office that Muslim, Muslim citizens will have free access. So there you go. Also, yesterday, Hezbollah has until now fired over 100 rockets at northern Israel. This happened yesterday. That was from Israel Today. Another one from them. Hezbollah fire has fired dozens of rockets at Mount Moran in northern Israel a short time ago. Meanwhile, evacuated residents of the northern border region issued another statement that they will not return home until Israel makes war on Hezbollah and ends the threat from Lebanon. Ever think you'd see these days? I knew we would see these days. I knew from the moment I heard about the rapture, I, I knew it was going to be in my lifetime. Once you realize that 1948 generation will not pass away when Israel was made and created in one day, became a nation in one day, May 14th, 1948. And I was born in 63, and I thought, if, if the Lord lets my heart beat long enough... Um, it's, I'm part of that generation. I knew it then. But wow, to see this stuff happening in real time, just to see Bible prophecy jumping off the pages at us every day is amazing. 
It's amazing. Okay. What else? Both Israel and Hamas, this is from Israel Today, are checking reports that Marwan Issa, the third most wanted Hamas terrorist in Gaza behind Sinwar and Mohammed Deef, was killed yesterday in a targeted Israeli airstrike. If he was, they're trying to figure out if he was or if he wasn't. If he was eliminated, this would be a major achievement for Israel and possibly spark an escalation in the conflict. We'll see. We'll see. That's what's going on in the Middle East right now. That's what's going on in Haiti. We live in a very dark world. Very dark world. But God. Last 48 hours, there have been 54 earthquakes over 4.0, eight of which were over 5.0. Listen to this in these last days. This is just, it's just wild. One world religion just taking flight. The Vatican urges Catholics to join Muslims for prayers and, me and meals during Ramadan. The Diocese of Bergamo, citing Pope Francis' directives on interreligious dialogue, issued a communique on Monday urging priests to seek out opportunities for interreligious dialogue during the holy month of Ramadan and invite the faithful to join in praying with Muslims and joining in their ritualistic media meals. <laughs> so there you go. It's like, wow, we're in the last days. It's everything. It's everything. Everything we're told to look for is happening. Everything. We're waiting for Jesus to get us in his perfect timing. This is from the Daily Mail. This is very interesting. The United States is facing a risk of rolling blackouts. As predicted, electricity demand doubled with artificial intelligence data centers and crypto mines presenting staggering challenge to the outdated grid. Innovations in AI, cloud computing, and crypto mining are driving demand for power up. The already ailing national grid is ill-equipped to deal with the increased demand, with demand projections doubling this year. Swaths of the U.S. are at risk of power outages with artificial intelligence data centers and cryptocurrency mines doubling forecasted energy demands over the coming year. It's just amazing. The artificial intelligence, it's going to grab all our power <laughs> and the cryptocurrency. It's just incredible. All right, you know how we keep talking about the friendly skies and how things are happening daily on airplanes now? Another one. This happened, I believe, in Australia from Insider Paper. 12 hospitalized after technical problem on an LATAM flight. 12 passengers were hospitalized Monday after a technical problem on an LATAM flight from Sydney to Auckland. It caused the plane to dip violently, the airline and first responders said. At least one person is in serious condition after the flight on a Boeing 787 Dreamliner experienced an unspecified technical event over the Tasman Sea. Passengers told New Zealand media that the plane quickly lost altitude, flinging some towards the ceiling. People flew through the air because they weren't wearing their seatbelts. Some people got pretty injured. A spokesman for the chile based airline said a technical event during the flight had caused a strong movement. Okay, listen to this one. Five passenger airplanes, five, five passenger airplanes reached 800 miles per hour after strong winds pushed the planes to insane speeds. There was a video of it. It was unbelievable. People were like screaming. One plane was a Virgin Atlantic flight from Washington to London. The plane hit 802 miles per hour, which is 40% faster than a typical cruising speed of 575 miles per hour. The winds reach speeds of 265 miles per hour at 35,000 feet above Washington. The Virgin Atlantic flight arrived in London 45 minutes early. But those people were scared on that plane, the video I saw. Crazy, crazy things happening. All right, so I'm going to try to show you a picture of this crazy thing. See that thing right there? <laughs> Watch this. This is from NBC News. Blue Dragon. That's that's what that thing's called. Blue Dragon season is upon us, but researchers remind beachgoers to think twice before touching them. I see that thing. I ain't touching it. <laughs> the bright 
and blue and silver sea slugs may look fun, but researchers warn that they are nothing to play with. Spring breakers flocking to Texas beaches this month could stumble upon a, a sight many have never seen. A bright blue and silver sea slug known as the blue dragon. While the tiny one inch creature may look like fun, they say that touching them could result in a painful sting. There's all kinds of stories of people accidentally stepping on these blue dragons or picking them up and squeezing them and getting stung. And yeah, it doesn't end well, said Jace Tunnel, a marine biologist at Texas A&M. Corpus Crispy. <laughs> I just... <laughs> That's clown world. Just every day there's things we've never seen, we've never heard about, we've never, you know, never experienced. I, it's, none of this stuff worries me because I belong to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus. So I, this doesn't freak me out or I don't worry about this. But And I know that Jesus isn't rattled by any of this. He's totally in control. But man, we're just living through crazy times. Point blank. Crazy. <laughs> All right. Let's do a couple testimonies of the day, okay? Michelle. My sister, brother, and I were raised by my grandparents who loved and breathed God. They had 10 children of their own, and they raised myself and my siblings, so 13 children in total. So I had a good, solid foundation. However, after I left school, I loved God, but I did not serve him or have a relationship with him. How sad. I worked for a security company, and it was a very busy and stressful job. I kept requesting that the company employ an additional person to assist me, but they kept promising, but it was all empty promises. They kept declining my leave as they had nobody to stand in for me. I was exhausted and I resigned three years ago, knowing full well that jobs are scarce. And during my time at home, I found God again, and I now have a good and solid relationship with him. I now only live for God and breathe God as my loving grandparents did. I am so against this world and I just want out. I'm looking forward to the rapture and to meet with our loving Jesus face to face and to see my grandparents again. Praise God, Michelle. Thank you for sharing that. More music. My name is Sina, and this is my testimony. God brought me and my mother out of Iran, a Muslim country, into Finland in Europe, where the freedom to explore different worldviews is possible for now. I always knew that there was a God. And the very first time I saw a cross in Finland was at age 14 on my way to school with my bike. I didn't know what a Bible or a church or Jesus was, but every day on my way to school, I couldn't help but stop my bike to stare at the cross. As if someone, as if something or someone was drawing me towards the cross. And the very first time I ever heard about Jesus, who he is and what he did for me, I just knew Jesus is real. I believed right away and I got saved. I got saved at age 15 and my life hasn't been the same since. I've made lots and lots of mistakes. I've hurt people and I've hurt myself. I've sinned greatly, but God, God has been gracious and patient with me. He has made me a better person. He has taught, he has taught me, cared for me and protected me all these years. He has been with me always. He loves me and I can't wait to see him. Praise Jesus. Thank you for sharing that. Let's do a couple of comments of the day. Okay. John, keep looking up. Keep your eyes on the kingdom, not this world. Jesus is coming. Believe in his finished work. Praying for you all. Thank you, John. Thank you. Wigs and Fluff. I love that name. Wigs and Fluff. There are missionaries in Haiti that are in danger. Please pray for these people of God. Amen. Like I asked earlier in the video. There's a lot of missionaries in Haiti. There's a lot of believers in Haiti. And that place has gone really, really, really dark in the way that coup is happening. So we need to, to pray for them. Cinema 2K. I decided to give up computers, TV, and radio. It took a burden off. I felt like I was awake for the first time in a long while. I am also giving up my hobbies, too. I am relieved. I feel like I am on the front porch of something good and important. God bless you all. You are on something. You are on the porch of something good and important. Jesus is about to come back to rapture the church. Paul told us, I have no need to write to you regarding the times and seasons that we would know. 
and you don't have to pay much attention to realize we're in the season. We're waiting. And if you don't understand what Jesus did for you and you don't belong to him, you need to, you need to make a decision very soon regarding that. Do you want to believe that 2,000 years ago, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world, Jesus, do you want to believe that he came here to die for your sins, to pay for your sins with his blood? Or do you want to just say, I don't need that. I don't, I don't, don't give me this. I just don't want this in my life. I'd rather trade my time left on earth for whatever this world has to offer than realize my sins have been paid for. You're living. It doesn't matter if you don't believe we're in the last days. It doesn't matter if you don't believe in the rapture. It doesn't matter if you've been placed here for such a time as this. Those people that are rejecting Christ or are just saying, like, I kind of believe, but I don't really, I'm not going to really believe that he rose again. I'm, I'm not a fanatic, you know, I'm not a Bible banger. You are in great risk of being left behind. We're very close to the rapture. And I'm just trying to get you to see that your sins have been paid for by the blood of the Lamb. And once you put your faith in that blood, It'll take every sin you've ever committed or ever will commit, and it will remove them from you as far as the east is from the west. There's power in the blood that Jesus shed. Why is there such power in that blood? Because he's the only begotten son of God. That's the most powerful substance that has ever touched earth is the blood of Jesus. Because that blood has the power to remove every sin, listen to me, every sin that has ever been committed, that blood has the power to remove. That blood has the power to wash every person who's ever lived, wash them white as snow. But you have to believe it. You have to have faith in the blood. But once you realize, wow, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus left the throne and came here to die for us, and when he was on the cross, all of our sins were placed on him. And his final words were, it is finished because the sin debt had been paid in full by the precious blood of the lamb. And then he died and was buried and rose again the third day. Well, if you believe all that, once you believe in the power of the blood that it'll wash you white as snow, clean slate, and then you believe in his finished work on the cross and his resurrection, you're saved. You're born again. God will put his Holy Spirit in you. He will never leave you. You're sealed unto the day of redemption. You're rapture ready. But you have to make that decision. Jesus is a gentleman. He doesn't force himself on anyone. He's a gentleman. It's like, I made the payment for your sins with my blood. The offer is right there. Are you going to say, oh, Jesus, thank you. Yes, I believe in the power of your blood and I believe in your finished work. Or are you going to say, nah, I'm going to take my chances. You know what? I'm more good than bad. I'm going to take my chances with that. I'm going to roll the dice regarding eternity. Bad idea. Bad idea. First Corinthians 15 verses three and four. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. It's the gospel right there. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. Grace is an unearned gift from God. We don't deserve it. We can't do anything to earn it. We can't add to it. We can't take away from it. Once you believe in the power of the blood and Jesus' finished work, you're saved by grace, that unearned gift from God, through faith, through believing this. You're saved. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If you could earn the tiniest bit of your salvation, 
If you could earn it, then Jesus would have to say, well, how did you earn your part? And how did this person earn their part? And oh, this person did a better job than you did. It's just not the way it works. It's not the way it works. It's all Jesus. Works are a beautiful thing. When you belong to the Lord and you do good works because you love the Lord, not thinking I'm getting anything out of just because you love the Lord, you do good work. That's beautiful. Fruit of the spirit. It's great. It's beautiful. It doesn't save you. Jesus going to the cross and shedding his blood is what saved you. You can't add to, so, because so many people get in this behavior kick where, well, if I do this, this, then I'll know I'm saved. It's not, it's not the salvation that's already been done. Jesus paid for your sins with his blood. Jesus went to the cross, was buried and rose again. That's your salvation right there. You can't add to it. You can't take away from it. But I will say again, because this always has been, works are a beautiful thing. When you love the Lord and you're doing beautiful works, it's beautiful. And there are rewards for those works, but they don't save you. I just want, I want to be clear on that. Okay. I love, I love Galatians 2.16 regarding works. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ. We might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Don't have the Lamb of God. Don't have the Lamb of God go to the cross and then try to get any way that you can take credit for it. He paid a serious price to save you. You thank him. Once you start adding, well, you, you know, yeah, that's fine that he went to the cross, but you got to do this, this, and this. Once you do that, it's like saying, Jesus, you know what, what you did, good job, but not good enough. Let me show you what I can do. Do you see the danger in that? I really hope you do. I really hope you see it. It's dangerous. It's a dangerous place to be. Yet there are many believers that are there. Many believers. Saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. It's an unearned gift from God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. But that's what I got for you today. I'm going to shut the camera off now, and I'm going to say a prayer for every person who watched this video. And if we're not raptured today, and you know what, guys? Today is a perfectly good day for the rapture. We are not long for this world. But if we're not, God willing, I will see you guys tomorrow. I love you guys.